Welcome to the Mam Journals. Most of us are in a situation where when we buy bikes, we like them to be a bit versatile, i.e. cover more than one need. A few of us are lucky enough to have bikes to cover every occasion, but these dual purpose bikes are naturally increasingly popular. Bikes like this fall naturally into sort of two categories. They are sports tourers or adventure tourers. Recently, I've been lucky enough to try some of the four-cylinder versions, and I've tried the, the BMW X1000R. I've also had a go on several of the Suzukis, the GT, which is a sports tourer, and the GX, which is a sports crossover. Having ridden the bikes, a good friend of mine very kindly said, well, you've tried two of the four-cylinders, would you like to try the Kawasaki Versus, the four-cylinder version. And of course, I was delighted to have that opportunity. This particular bike is the SE GT, so it's exceptionally well equipped, as we'll go through. What I'm going to do today is, usual way, I'm going to go through detailed specifications. And the reason why I do that is I'm very conscious that some of you have been kind enough to find this video on the basis that you're actually considering the bike. Others of you, I know, are kind enough just to follow the channel generally and have a general interest in bikes. And you may choose to actually miss out the detailed specifications and go straight to the riding section where I'll be covering a lot of the specifications again anyway. We'll come back and I'll talk about my conclusions of this, the Kawasaki Versus 1000 SE GT. Okay, so let's go through the specifications of the bike. And as you can probably tell by some of the photographs, it was wet when we prepared it. And it is a bike that actually cleans up really well. But as usual, let's start with the engine. Okay, um, this is a 1043 cc straight four. Um, liquid cool double overhead cam. It produces 120 PS at 9,000 revs and 102 newton meters of torque at seven and a half. I thought it might be useful and say if you're watching this section it might be that you're actually considering other bikes as well. The GX Suzuki that I tried actually is 150 PS at 11,000 revs and the XR is well last year's model was 165 brake horsepower and this year's model the 2024 is 170 ps at 11,000 revs as well the bike is fitted with a six speed um, kawasaki quick shifter as indeed are all the other bikes they're fitted with with quick shifters so it's a feature that appears very regularly on these adaptable adventure tourer sports tourer style bikes with big engine capacities the bike is fitted with a 21 litre tank and it's actually as you can tell by the size of it really it's it's quite a heavy bike it's 257 kilos and just again to give you a benchmark comparison the suzuki is 232 and the most powerful of the bikes in that i've tested of this category is the BMW and that's 226 so more power and significantly less weight. Uh, not surprisingly this bike is on paper probably the slowest of the three that we're talking about but, but slow's a word you've got to be careful using really because we're talking about a 140 mile an hour bike so it's certainly brisk. Okay, in terms of the frame and dimensions of the bike, this is a, it's a twin tube aluminium frame and at the front it's, again, quite common characteristics and measurements. It's got 150 millimetres of travel on the front forks and it's got, actually got 152 at the rear. These are quite normal measurements in terms of these dual purpose bikes. Sports bike just to refresh your memory, would probably be something like 120, whilst a, a genuine off-road bike, and this is not an off-road bike, um, despite the fact it's called an adventure, um, would have nearer 200 millimetres of travel. So looking at the, uh, the rake of the bike, this is um, 
This is a 27 degree rake, i.e., and again, sorry if, you, you've watched, if you've watched the channel before, you know I often give this measurement. This is, the, the rake is the, the measurement of the angle between an upright from the spindle to the degree of those, how much of the pie it takes, and that's 27 degrees. Quite touring-esque in its style. With, a, with that sort of rake. The GX, which is a sports crossover, is 25.3, just to give you, again, that sort of feel for it. In terms of wheelbase, contact point to contact point uh, of the tyres, this is quite long, um, as in 1.520 metres. Uh, and then, again, just giving you another comparison, the GX is 14.70. So 1.47 metres. So this is longer with more of a rake on it. So that would tell me that the bike should be stable and possibly not as quick turning as others in the category. In terms of um, suspension, these are 43 millimeter inverted forks. At the rear, it's fitted with a laid back back link unit you, and the adjustment on the preload of that is actually electronic so you do that from the dash and we'll go through that in a moment. Uh, the bike is fitted with 12070 17s. The idea of normally putting smaller wheels these 17 is to, to quicken the steering so it be when we go out for a ride we'll explore whether the geometry wins or whether the wheels win in terms of handling speed. At the rear it's fitted with a 180 5517. Um, the bike comes standard with these Bridgestones on it and actually once I got used to the bike I found them good. As I said in the introduction this bike is the SE Special Equipment GT Grand Tourer and it is remarkably well equipped and it's got this Starting at the front, it's got this adjustable large screen, easy to adjust. You, you, you can't do it on the go because it's a two-handed job. Um, well, you'd be more talented than I am if you can do it on the go. And it's got the hand guards, it's got heated grips, it's got cruise control, it's got sliders on, on here. And coming to the rear, obviously it's, as a Grand Tourer, it's nicely equipped with luggage. That's a, you've got 56 litre in the panniers and that's a 47 litre top box with the, the pad on the back for the passenger. It is a really nicely equipped bike. It's also got a GPS bracket on there and Alan's chosen to, to use the Garmin on it and it fits really well and doesn't obscure your vision in any way when you're riding. On the dimensions and technically this seat height is 800 and 40, which is actually the same as the BMW, and five less than the Suzuki. But certainly in the suspension settings that I had it on, I didn't find it um, a particularly tall bike. I found that I had, I had sensible contact with it, and possibly because this seat's got a bit of give in it. So I think, you know, if they have the bench, a harder bench seat, it's like the, the BMW definitely felt tall and the weight on it definitely felt higher than this bike. The other things that are included in the SEGT package are, are these cornering lights here. The more you lean over, the brighter they come. Um, the daytime running lights, which I don't ride at night, if I'm honest, um, but I certainly find that these lights do help others see you during when you are riding and are very useful. Um, another very practical thing about this bike, because it is really a very sensible bike. It's got a main stand on it, it's included in there. Others, there are options. And for a chain driven bike, it's nice just to be able to pop it up, easy for cleaning and easy for adjusting. Like most bikes, um, a lot of the technology that you're enabling and is controlled up at the front via the dash and via the clusters on either side. Uh, the, the bike has two display modes. You can do, well, actually three. You, you've, this is the standard sort of setting, but you can have that in white or black, obviously daytime or um, nighttime, depending on what you, what you want. And you can do it so that it, it does it automatically and, and lights shifts across.
In terms of the modes, you've got a few modes on, on the bike. The bike is currently sat in Sport. If you hold the button down, changes to Road, go again. Rain, obviously the softest power delivery of the three. And then you've got User, or as they call it, Rider, where you can put individual settings in in the normal way. I found the controls slightly less intuitive than some of the other systems, but I'm, I suspect it's about familiarity. I'm used to the BMW system because I've got a BMW and I'm used to the Suzuki because I've got one of those. So I naturally find them easier. And it wasn't overly complicated to do, but you, I suspect once you've had it for a thousand miles or so, you'll be very comfortable cursing through. In terms of um, cruise control, very easy to set via this button here. And easy to, to switch on and off in the normal way, i.e. touching the brakes, changing gear, or closing the throttle. I like the dash, I thought it's nice and clear, and easier to read. Heated grips, again, single button over here. They, they, these are factory fitted grips, and as I often find factory fitted grips, they're sometimes not as hot as the aftermarket options that you have, but I certainly found them okay and if I'm honest some of the the aftermarket ones actually get too hot you can end up sort of very rarely running them on the on full power. As you can see on on the dash here as well as having the power modes you've also got the level of traction control that you want and as you can see with this rider mode you can actually adjust the compression and rebound to a slight degree on your suspension settings. You've also got this preload setting as I talked about when we talked about the rear suspension unit and you've got three settings on that. You can go for rider, rider with luggage and two up fully laden. As we said earlier you can, you've got the black stroke white with the various options in terms of what you're looking. You've also got two choices in terms of what displays in front of you and you just cursor through in the normal way and you choose whether you want type 1 or type 2 cursor it down again, press select, type 2 selected and then you press the reset button on the left hand and that shows you a different display area with a bit more colour in it and a few more uh, different options in terms of what you've got on display with it. It's, it's quite amusingly it's got this uh, uh, throttle and brake measurement here. I'm not sure it'll change how you ride the bike but it, it might amuse you on a, on a long journey and you can see the lean angle here on the bike as well. Oh, It's all a bit of good fun really. Okay so having gone through the specifications I think you can tell that this particular version is very well equipped and without spoiling the conclusions I've got to say this is probably the best touring bike of the three that I've tried. Anyway let's go for a ride and see, where, see how we found it. For those of you kind enough to watch my videos on a regular basis then you'll know I, I tend to like to ride the bikes over several days before coming to any conclusions. This bike was no exception and on the first day I rode the bike about 90 miles just to familiarise myself with the controls and the general feel of the bike. I don't normally film on the first day but I did take the opportunity to run the bike over my usual bump test road. With 150mm of travel at the front and 153 at the rear there was nothing along this road that certainly troubled it. Kawasaki described the electronic suspension as skyhook. Uh, this is the idea that the bike feels suspended from a vertical line above it and that the suspension does all the work underneath you. It is certainly a plush ride and without the firm feel of the more sports orientated tourers out there, including Kawasaki's own, it is after all an adventure tourer. You can electronically adjust 
the rear preload for solo, solo plus luggage and two up with luggage and further adjustment is available for the rebound and the compression. Kawasaki say on their website that the suspension, whilst not designed for off-road use, the long travel suspension's ability to cope with the less than perfect street conditions allows the Versys to remain composed, where bikes with stiffer, sportier setups would require backing off the throttle. It also states that the lightweight 17-inch wheels, front and rear, contribute to quick sporting handling. So clearly the decisions on suspension and setup were very deliberate. And with so many poorly maintained roads to choose from in Oxfordshire, I can confirm it certainly handles them well. I will come back to the quick sporting handling later. On the second day of riding I headed to the AV8 Cafe at Kemble, which is an old RAF airfield, and now, amongst other things, a graveyard for commercial airliners. Nice gentle roads through the Gloucestershire countryside gave me an opportunity to reflect on the ergonomics and the comfort. The seat, like the suspension, is plush and, in addition, spacious. The specification described the seat height as 840mm high, which I'm sure is right, but it didn't feel particularly tall and clearly the softer seat, like this, gives a bit more than the thinner, harder seats associated with more sports orientated bikes. The riding position is roomy and for me the ergonomics work really well. The switch gear falls easily to hand and the large adjustable front screen offers good wind protection. In conditions where I'm unlikely to experience spray, which obscures the screen, I tend to ride with the screens at position where I can just peer over the top, but I would definitely raise it in the drier summer conditions, confident that I could actually reduce wind noise further. This version of the bike is exceptionally well equipped, and it's the SE GT, and the hand guards and heated grips all add to the comfort. The cruise control is easy to activate and set, and disengaged in the normal way. You just touch the brakes, the clutch, the gears, or just close the throttle. I do find cruise control useful on longer journeys, and this bike is clearly designed for those sort of road trips. The brakes are good. They're progressive rather than sharp, but certainly two up or heavily laden, I actually prefer that. Plush which is slightly softer, suspension and on-off brakes are not natural bedfellows. You have two choices of dash display as well as the now common black and white background lighting. The first mode is more traditional and with information you might actually use and the more colourful display takes information from the 6-axis IMU to show lean angles for those amused by such things. Throttle openings and brake pressure are also displayed. It's all just a bit of fun. In town, although the bike is heavy, 257 kilos make it one of the heavier bikes in the category, it doesn't ride heavy, even at slower speeds, which is when you would normally feel it. It carries its weight lower than, for example, the BMW 1000XR, which is frankly a projectile dressed up as a Tora. I certainly did feel the weight when I was pushing it onto my ramp for cleaning, and for those of you that in your bike life need to move the bike around as a dead weight, it's something you might want to bear in mind. The bike rides well at low speeds. It feels balanced. The quick shifter is better at higher revs and speeds, so I found myself using the clutch, which is light. There is a very slight judder as you pull away in first, actually similar to my Z900RS, but this is a characteristic rather than an issue as such. The softer suspension makes precision filtering a little more challenging than bikes with firmer setups and with the panniers fitted it would probably take a while for me to get my the dimensions in my head that may be a compromise that many of us 
could actually live with. It's certainly not a difficult bike to ride in town and the turning circle is good. The engine, gearing and fueling is very comfortable and smooth at in low speeds and in traffic. The 21 litre tank and an average of 48 miles per gallon gives a theoretical range of 220 miles which felt about right. I actually refuelled at 200 miles with the light flashing. Interestingly I rode past a few garages before finally stopping which told me that I was actually finding the bike very comfortable. I've got to say on some of the bikes I ride I'm actually happy for the light to come on and like to take a break as soon as it does. The electronic range indicator was slightly less helpful. Fully brimmed, it suggested I had a range of 168 miles, which clearly isn't the case. I'm not sure what that was all about. Reflecting on the gearing in the gearbox, the bike has quite tall gearing, which means that at 70 miles an hour, 120 kph, uh, you're pulling at about 4,500 revs. The bike feels really relaxed and smooth at this all adding to the sense that this is a mile-eater. The quick shifter works well in the mid to higher revs and gears, but perhaps less so in lower gears and revs, which is not uncommon. I would describe it as competent rather than brilliant. The straight 4 1043cc engine is actually the same engine that Kawasaki use in their Ninja 1000SX Sports Tourer but it's in a lower state of tune. The Versus produces 120 PS and that is certainly less than other four-cylinder bikes in this category. Riding of a lot of bikes I've actually been pleasantly surprised how I can feel the differences in power. As an example I rode the 22 Z SX 1000 Kawasaki and when I was deciding which bike to buy and that produces 140 PS although the latest one does 142 I could definitely feel the extra 10 PS of the Suzuki GSX 1000 GT which I ultimately opted for. I was therefore not surprised when the Versus felt significantly slower than either of these two sports tourer. Slower is of course not the same as slow this is a powerful straight four and smooth at low and middle revs. It does liven and indeed buzz up between six and ten thousand revs. Which brings me back to the Kawasaki comment of quick sporting handling. With plush suspension, a long wheelbase and a 27 degree rake, putting 17 inch wheels on is not going to turn it into a sports bike. I can definitely ride my Suzuki Sports Tourer faster than I could ride this, but whilst the Versus is clearly more Tourer than Sports, and whilst I doubt you will be shouting Banzai joyously into your helmet, it can crack on. Drop it down a few gears, keep the suspension under load with the throttle, and you can probably make as much progress as many of us actually need. Kawasaki described this bike as an adventure tourer and that is exactly what it is. But you can certainly ride it enthusiastically if you choose to do so. So how did I get on? Well, I'm very lucky making this channel and I get an opportunity to ride an awful lot of bikes. Some of them I like, some of them I love and some of them I respect. This bike is definitely in the latter category. It's exceptionally well equipped, it's really comfortable, and it's the sort of bike we all should be buying to tour on. Now, I'm sure that most of you have watched at least a couple of episodes of Star Trek. Now, the invariably logical Spock and the pragmatic and practical Scotty would invariably be recommending this bike as one we should buy. The only problem I've got is I'm not sure that the passionate and enthusiastic Captain Kirk 
would actually buy one. I do hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you found it useful. And if you have, you might be kind enough to press like or consider subscribing to the channel. But, of course, what is most important is that you ride safe and you stay well.